Ever find yourself drawn to the same kinds of characters over and over again? From Harry Potter to Luke Skywalker, from Katniss Everdeen to Frodo Baggins, do they all seem strangely familiar? And what if I told you these patterns aren't just figments of your imagination, there's something deeply woven into the fabric of our minds? Well, buckle up, because we're about to dive into the fascinating world of Carl Jung, a maverick psychiatrist who didn't just follow the path of his mentor, Freud, but blazed his own trail. He's the guy who put those puzzles of repeated patterns into perspective and gave us the concept of archetypes. In this episode, we're gonna dig into the intriguing history of archetypes, decode the key principles that define them, and here's the fun part. We're going to uncover how these ancient patterns play out in our everyday lives. So, if you've ever wondered why certain stories resonate with you, or why some characters feel like old friends, or enemies, then stick around. We're about to embark on a journey that's not just about understanding stories better, but about understanding ourselves too. Let's get started. Now that we've set the stage, it's time to meet the man himself, Carl Gustav Jung. An explorer of the mind, a rebel in the world of psychiatry, and a lover of myth and story. Now, Jung wasn't your typical psychiatrist. His ideas shook the very foundations of the discipline, and his theories, well, they were revolutionary. Born to a pastor in Switzerland in 1875, Jung was always surrounded by the spiritual and the metaphysical. This love for the mysterious and the unknown didn't fade as he grew older. Instead, it led him to dig deeper into the human psyche. He wasn't satisfied with just observing the conscious mind, oh no. He dared to venture into the depths of the unconscious. And that's where he parted ways with Freud, his mentor. While Freud saw the unconscious as a dark cellar full of repressed desires and traumas, Jung saw it as an abundant source of creativity and wisdom. It was during his exploration of this vast unconscious territory that Jung stumbled upon something extraordinary. Patterns. Similar patterns, to be precise, found across different cultures, religions, and dreams. He saw these patterns as evidence of common, universal themes and symbols. Think about it. Why do so many cultures have stories of a great flood or a hero's journey? Why do we dream about falling or flying? Jung believed that these weren't just random coincidences. He saw these patterns as echoes from a deep, shared reservoir of human experience and wisdom, something he called the collective unconscious. So, imagine our minds as an iceberg. The tip, that's our conscious mind. But beneath the surface, there's so much more. That's our personal unconscious, full of our own memories and experiences. And then, deeper still, there's a vast, shared ocean, the collective unconscious, where our archetypes live. These archetypes, they're everywhere. From Luke Skywalker in Star Wars to Neo in The Matrix, they influence our stories, our dreams, our beliefs. They're the reason why certain movies resonate with us, why some books become bestsellers, and why certain ads make us want to buy stuff we don't even need. They're like the puppeteers behind the scenes pulling the strings in ways we don't even realize. But hey, don't take my word for it. It might seem a bit out there, right? These invisible patterns shaping our lives? It's controversial, I get it. But once you start noticing these archetypes, it's like learning the magician's secrets. You can't unsee them. So how about we peel back the curtain a bit more? Up next, we're diving deeper into these mysterious archetypes. Let's find out what they're all about, shall we? So, let's take a closer look at what an archetype really is. Think of it as a prototype, an original model of a person, ideal example, or a prototype upon which others are copied, patterned, or emulated. But it's more than that. It's a universal symbol that evokes deep and sometimes unconscious responses in our psyche. Kind of like a well-prepared meal, an archetype satisfies our psychological appetite, evoking emotions and feelings that are innate and deeply ingrained in our human nature. There's a collection of these archetypes, a little bit like a psychological Avengers team, each with its own role and characteristics. 
Now, the first member of this team, and arguably the most important one, is the self. The self, according to Jung, represents the unification of the unconsciousness and consciousness of an individual. Picture it as the CEO of our psyche, orchestrating and harmonizing all other aspects of our personality. Then, there's the shadow. It's a bit like that drawer in your kitchen full of things you don't want to deal with, but can't throw away. It's the darker, hidden side of us, encompassing the traits and instincts we choose to ignore or reject. However, it's not all doom and gloom. The shadow can also be a source of creativity and individuality. In fact, wouldn't it be dull if we were all just sunshine and rainbows? Now, if the shadow is the drawer full of things we'd rather forget, the anima and animus are the picture frames on the mantle, representing the feminine and masculine aspects within us. These archetypes are sort of like the yin and yang within each individual, regardless of gender, providing balance and nuance to our personalities. They're like salt and pepper, each adding a different flavor, but necessary for a well-rounded taste. Of course, there are many more archetypes in Jung's theory, each with its own fascinating characteristics and effects. But why do we even have these archetypes? What's their purpose? Well, isn't it obvious that they add depth and variety to our personalities, making us more than just one-dimensional beings? Now, brace yourself for a somewhat controversial thought. Despite the popularity of personality tests based on Jung's archetypes, it's important to remember that we are more complex than any archetype or set of archetypes can completely capture. We are not just a collection of archetypes, but unique individuals with our own quirks and idiosyncrasies. In other words, just because someone identifies with the archetype of the hero doesn't mean they're always going to rush into burning buildings to save kittens. Remember, when it comes to the human psyche, it's more of a jazz improvisation than a well-rehearsed symphony. Now that we have a better understanding of what archetypes are and the major ones identified by Jung, let's take a step further into the intriguing world of archetypes and their roles. Moving on to the role of archetypes in the human psyche, it's like being on a roller coaster ride. The thrills, the chills, and unexpected turns of this journey into the self are driven by these invisible forces. So, what are these forces exactly? Are they the puppet masters pulling our strings, or the unseen winds filling our sails, steering our course through life's stormy seas? Well, it's no secret that archetypes shape our thoughts behaviors, and perceptions. We see them at work every day in our dreams, our choices, even our Google search histories. Now, I'm not saying we're all just puppets on a string here, but isn't it fascinating to ponder how much of our freedom is influenced by these universal patterns? And speaking of influence, let's look at the process of individuation. That's Jung's fancy term for becoming a fully realized individual. Now, I know what you're thinking. Isn't individuation all about being unique, being one's own person? You're absolutely right. But here's a curveball for you. It's these shared archetypes, these common threads in the tapestry of human experience, that actually help us to distinguish ourselves. Think about it. It's like baking a cake. We all start with the same basic ingredients, flour, sugar, eggs. But it's how we combine them, the ratios we use, the flavors we add, that determine whether we end up with a classic vanilla sponge or a spicy gingerbread. It's the same with archetypes. We all have them, but it's how they mix and mingle in our psyche that shapes our unique personality. On a lighter note, have you ever noticed how archetypes seem to have a knack for dramatic entrances? They're like those pesky relatives who turn up unannounced and expect you to drop everything. They're not knocking gently on the door of our consciousness. No, they're kicking it down and making themselves at home. Now, you might be wondering, how do these archetypes make themselves known to us? That, dear listener, is where symbols and motifs come into play. These are the universal language of the unconscious, the hieroglyphics of our inner world. It's as though our unconscious is an artist, expressing itself through these symbolic representations. Imagine, if you will, a dream where you're being chased by a ferocious tiger. 
On the surface, it's just a scary dream. But dig a little deeper, and you might find the shadow archetype lurking, symbolized by the tiger. But let's not limit ourselves to dreams. Archetypes and their symbols can be found everywhere, from the myths of ancient Greece to the latest Hollywood blockbuster. It seems our collective unconscious has a thriving career in the film industry. Now, I know it's controversial to suggest that archetypes have such a pervasive influence on our lives. Some might even argue it diminishes our agency, our freedom of choice. But I see it differently. Recognizing these archetypes isn't about surrendering our free will. Instead, it's about gaining a deeper understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. In the end, it's all a dance, isn't it? The archetypes lead, we follow, and together we create the dance of life. But don't let that deter you from taking the lead once in a while. After all, even the best dancers know when to improvise. Now brace yourself as we dive into the world of practical, real-life examples of these archetypes. Stay tuned, because it's going to be a wild ride. Imagine walking down a dark alley, your heart pounding in your chest. Now, picture that the alley is a metaphor for your mind, and the darkness represents the unknown parts of your personality. This is where the shadow archetype lurks, waiting to jump out at the most inconvenient times. It's like the roommate you didn't ask for but got stuck with anyway always leaving their dirty dishes in the sink and playing loud music when you're trying to sleep. So, how does this unwanted roommate show up in our relationships? Ah, love. It's like a beautiful garden, full of vibrant flowers and chirping birds. But lurking beneath the surface, ready to pop up like an unwanted weed, is the shadow. It's the part of ourselves we don't want to acknowledge, much less introduce to our significant others. Take jealousy, for instance. You're out with your partner when an attractive stranger catches their eye. Suddenly, the green-eyed monster of jealousy rears its ugly head. But instead of acknowledging this feeling, you might lash out at your partner, accusing them of disrespect or infidelity. You see, the shadow can be quite the puppet master, pulling the strings of our emotions without us even realizing it. And just like any good puppet show, it's all about the performance. Isn't it interesting how we can play different roles in different relationships? With our parents, we might be the obedient child, while with our friends, we're the life of the party. But who's pulling the strings? That's right, it's our friend the shadow, making sure we put on a good show. Now I know what you're thinking. This shadow guy sounds like a real piece of work. And you'd be right. But here's the kicker. Our shadow isn't all bad. In fact, it can be a catalyst for growth. Think about it. When we recognize our shadow, we're forced to confront the parts of ourselves we're not so proud of. It's a bit like finding out your favorite sweater has a giant hole in the back. You can either pretend it's not there, or you can learn to sew and fix it. Recognizing our shadow gives us the chance to sew up those parts of ourselves, leading to more authentic fulfilling relationships. But let's not beat around the bush here. This process isn't exactly a walk in the park. It's more like a hike up a steep, rocky mountain. But isn't the view from the top worth the struggle? Now, hold on to your hats, because here comes a controversial opinion. Conflict in relationships isn't always a bad thing. In fact, it can be a sign that your shadow is trying to make itself known. It's like a smoke alarm warning you that something needs your attention. Instead of fighting it, we could try listening to it. But let's circle back to our unwanted roommate, the one leaving dirty dishes in the sink. Maybe, just maybe, that roommate isn't so bad. Maybe they're just trying to teach you a thing or two about patience, tolerance, or even cleanliness. Maybe, in their own annoying way, they're helping you become a better version of yourself. So, the next time you're walking down that dark alley of your mind and you bump into your shadow, don't run away. Invite it out for a cup of coffee. Who knows? You might just find you have more in common than you think. Our journey into the labyrinth of the shadow archetype, its manifestations in our personal relationships, and the unexpected growth it can bring, 
has been enlightening. It's not a trip everyone would willingly take, but you've journeyed with me, and for that I'm grateful. Carl Jung, the man who introduced us to the concept of the shadow, once said, One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. In other words, it is by diving into our darkness, acknowledging and understanding it, that we truly grow and evolve. So, as you go forth into your daily lives, remember that the shadows in your relationships aren't merely sources of conflict but opportunities for growth. Embrace them, learn from them, and let them guide you to a deeper understanding of yourself. Up until next time, take care, and see you soon.